um, about intelligent societies elsewhere. Like maybe we will never find it, but it, it does give us an opportunity to, to talk about ourselves and to talk about where we are in the universe in a way yeah. that's, that's yeah. really interesting. And, and, and just because and it's helpful. potentially hard to find doesn't yeah. mean it's not there. I mean, part of the of issue course. here is that we're just dealing with the fact that our human time scale is really, really, really short compared to cosmic time scales. Like, mm -hmm. if we thought of a few thousand years as not too long, yeah. um, I think we'd have better luck in, the, in, find, in answering these that's questions, right? That's absolutely true. Yeah. And yeah, we are just the beginning of a really long journey. Yeah. Um, you know, exoplanet science, so the study of planets around other stars, is what, 22 years old? Wow. Um, you could argue it's maybe a little bit older than that, depending on what you regard as being the first detection. But the first detection of a planet around a sun like star outside the solar system was in 1995. Um, and astronomy as a science is about, what, 6,000 years old? So this is the youngest yes. branch of astronomy. Science. Yeah. Well, there's a science. There is a lot of astrology in there. We have been looking at the stars for 6,000 years. Yeah. Whether we applied the scientific method is up for debate. But um, you know, we've certainly had eyes on the universe for 6,000 years. And it's only in the last 20-ish that we've been able to say for certainty that there are planets going around those other stars, even though we suspected it from deepest antiquity that the, the solar system is not particularly uh, the, the Earth was in some way not special, uh, and that other other stars in the sky probably had planets of their own, and there was various philosophers who said that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is the point you're trying to make here, is that we will not know the answer to some of the questions we're dearly trying to find out for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. But the point is that even though we don't get to know the answers in our lifetime, okay. we still should go and do it, even just because... At some point, our, our descendants, you know, many generations hence, will know these answers. And it's important for humans to know these answers. Mm -hmm. The probability is good. I mean, so one of the things we do know from our searches of exoplanets is the fact that we've gone from zero to 3,000 exoplanets in 25 years yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that they do tend to be common. These are all generally more massive or too far out. Not These are not the habitable zone exoplanets. Uh, but what we're finding is stars tend to have, on order, a planet at mm -hmm. least a planet each. They're mm -hmm. very common. There are, I don't know, half a trillion stars in our galaxy? Ish. Ish. Yeah. Um, so assuming, you know, and I think our statistics are good enough at this point that we can say robustly that most stars have planets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of planets out there. That's a lot of yeah. possibility, yeah. even if we don't yeah. know how to look quite yet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. OK. So in this realm of possibility, if we start getting um, you know, we, we know from, from our study of uh, radio waves and, and what we can kind of broadcast into space that we could theoretically just kind of point the internet at space and have it go out. In mm -hmm. a very, in super simplistic terms, there are better ways of saying this, but it, it could happen, right? Um, how would we, if we were to receive somebody else's, how would we, what would we do about that? How would we confirm that? How would we even, saying in the very slim chance, now that we've said, now that we all have an understanding of how incredibly slim that chance is, um, saying in the very slim margin that somebody very similar or mm -hmm. relatively similar to us is sending technological signals specifically towards us, then yeah. what do we do? Well, I mean, I guess there are maybe two different um, narratives on that, that kind of story. There's the, the science narrative mm -hmm. um, and then there's the science fiction narrative. So, I mean, I think I'd be interested to hear what Pippa says about you know, how science fiction deals with this, the first contact moment. Absolutely. I mean, you know, what, what kind of yeah. mechanisms do characters in these stories put in place to deal with yeah. the, the second? Also from a policy perspective Yes, as well. yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's not just a sort of speculation um, uh, we, we, we can think about it from the terms of how sort of people actually organise themselves sort of here and now. Uh, science fiction, of course, has been looking at these uh, sort of questions for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> and there's a whole sort of range of answers, you know, sort of, uh, sort of greasing them, uh, sort of killing them, usually killing them. Usually they kill us, we kill them. That's usually how the narrative ends. That's, uh, <laughs> um, you know, that's how fiction works, really. There's yeah. got to be conflicts. Uh, interestingly, actually, one, one interesting example of 
of uh, science fiction narrative that does engage with contact with alien intelligent life that doesn't involve conflict. And I was just mentioning this mm -hmm. just before we went on air. And that's a book by Michael Faber called The Book of Strange New Things, in which a Christian missionary goes off to another planet to try and convert the aliens to Christianity. And it's, it is a, it's an unusual book because, it, because of its lack of conflict on that planet, because of how welcoming the aliens are, at least initially. And you read this book with your own um, uh, sense that you know where it's going. You assume it's all going to go horribly wrong on the planet and the aliens will rise up in arms and kill the humans on their base. And of course that doesn't, sorry, plot spoiler, that doesn't happen. But there is conflict in the book, conflict of another type. Um, so we have these narratives and I think it's interesting how, how we, we can't tell yet how accurate science fiction is at anticipating the future because we mm -hmm. haven't got there yet. Yeah. Uh, science fiction has been very good at anticipating aspects of our current lives and very bad at anticipating other mm -hmm. uh, aspects. You know, we don't all travel around in our own sort of like individual hovercrafts or whatever, yeah. but, uh, yeah. but we do have geostationary satellites, which was a prediction in, in science fiction. So we can't yet tell, but I think it's very interesting that we construct these narratives for ourselves. Uh, as a way of perhaps trying to anticipate the future and that first conflict, co con I said conflict, it's a bit Freudian, first contact. And so there are various things that have happened to try and maybe plan for that. And one of those is the United Nations Office of Outer Space Activities, which was set up in the 1960s, I think, in an attempt to get uh, nation states to think about how they are uh, how they, how they should act responsibly in outer space um, and how they should interact responsibly with objects in outer space. The vast majority of the United Nations Office of Outer Space Activities uh, is around, not about intelligent life, it's about sort of interacting with rocks and planets and asteroids and comets and so on. Um, but it's very concerned with not just how we receive information and how we sort of send information, but how we physically go out into outer space, in our spaceships, what we do on the surface of other planets and what we bring back to our own planets. And I think um, it's very concerned with issues around colonization of outer space and being colonized and the, um, uh, the intentional impact that we might want to have on other objects and the unintentional consequences of what might happen when we go out to explore those other planets hmm. and rocks and asteroids and so on. Yeah. Mm. So in your experience, have you mostly dealt, or like how, I, I would like to explore a little bit more of this kind of nations divvying up space and space rights versus yeah. private entities yes. divvying up space and space yes. rights. And, um, you know, as we get more into private entities going after asteroid mining, for example, um, how... Uh, how does a national perspective play into yeah. that? Yeah, with difficulty. Um, I have to say, when the United Nations first started working on this, it wasn't really properly anticipated mm -hmm. that private sectors would actually start to take a lead huh. in outer space exploration. It uh, was the assumption that it would be the nation states in control. So, for instance, the United Nations Treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, <coughs> gives nation states the responsibility to act in certain ways mm -hmm. and to do certain things in outer space and not do other things. Like yeah. not pollute outer space, not put nuclear weapons into outer space, not stake claim is specifically yeah. not to not to put your own little flag on an asteroid and say this belongs to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so it puts the responsibility that when individual countries go into outer space, they are doing so on behalf of all mankind. Air quotes. Um, so it can't really kind of keep up. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, with uh, sort of the ambitions of the private sector yeah. to go and do, say, and, land yeah. on asteroids and do strip mining. So really, by enacting that treaty, what has been done unintentionally is carve out an enormous amount of area for other entities to come in and potentially yes. stick their little flag on something and say this is for Enron. 
Yes and no. I think it does still put a responsibility on member states to make sure that they they regulate those Mm. private entities properly. Mm -hmm. They still have the responsibility. So say uh, Enron or Elon Musk sort of put something up into into outer space and it does a lot of damage Mm -hmm. and it even falls back down to earth and hits someone on the head and kills them, then the the relevant uh, country... Um, say that that uh, corporation is incorporated in would could and would be held responsible I see. for that okay. under the terms of the treaty. Mm-hmm. So and that's what I was doing in uh, the UK government several years ago. I was the regulator of the Outer Space Act. So I was going after British satellite companies and less um, less commonly British uh, companies that had interest in in rocket launches to make sure that they were acting sort of responsibly mm-hmm. and safely, mm-hmm. really. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, and, and to make sure that they weren't just sort of, uh, you know, acting like cowboys in outer space. Yes. <laughs> and did you did you find a, a, a degree of cowboyness in? There's a degree of ambition. Space cowboys. Um, I wouldn't say cowboys exactly. Uh, there's a degree of ambition. I think it, so. This is a general philosophical point about how governments interact with private entities. Whether you try and let them do what they want to do to a certain extent because what they're doing is interesting and sort mm-hmm. of extent the boundaries or whether you try and put a cap on it they had a degree of ambition that we were always one step behind to be honest we were always trying to keep up with what these international corporations were trying to do say if they were trying to launch rocket launches from the middle of the ocean Mm -hmm. then we were struggling to work out how to how to deal with that and how to make sure it was safe Mm -hmm. Uh, if they were sort of saying that they wanted to turn the Caribbean island into a rocket launching site then we were struggling to keep up with that or and that was still some of this was still firmly in the realm of science fiction still you know wanting to launch uh, stuff that would land on an asteroid and mm-hmm. mine it for say helium or rare metals or whatever and this stuff is still in the realm of science fiction but less so and I think we, we, we can talk about that how fiction maybe anticipates the reality and how we all as scientists and, and writers do these sorts of thought experiments that maybe try and anticipate what the sort of future reality is going to be yeah. and government has to do that too yeah. when it tries to regulate for the future yeah. yeah I actually wanted to check in with you guys and see if there's anything that you would like to touch base on we did a, a decent amount of talk before um, this started, but I wanted to see if there's anything else we wanted to touch on before we open up for questions. Um, so maybe I could bookend what Pippa was saying about like policy. Um, and there, the policy that scientists have tried to come up with when it comes to de- when you receive a signal, what do you do next? Um, so the International Academy of Astronautics has a permanent committee focused on the issue of SETI. Uh, and in the late 80s, they came up with um, a set of protocols as in, you know, this is a checklist for the things you should do if you have a detection, you know, a radio signal or some kind of evidence of intelligent life. And so, you know, this was a, a document that was published um, and it was given, I think, to the UN Committee on Aerospace Affairs. Um, and it was suggested that scientists in SETI should sign it and agree to abide by these conditions. There are zero signatories to that agreement. <laughs> Um, so what that means is that we have a nice set of guidelines, but um, when the eventual possible event happens, you're not legally bound by those guidelines. Yeah. So mm. it may well be the case that you know you receive a signal and you, you do your diligence and you figure out, okay, that this is not a, an instrumentation effect. I'm not observing a signal that's bounced back off the moon from the Earth. I'm not seeing something that's a stray satellite, I'm I'm seeing something that's real, it's outside the solar system, it's proof of intelligent life. Um, The steps you should take, um, as it was written in the 80s, take a long time, they take several months. Um, I don't think you can keep secrets for several months nowadays. you know, it was written before 24-hour news was a thing, before um, social media was a thing, and the, the transmission of information has totally changed. Um, so you can't really keep secrets and stop them from leaking, because them. one of the first things you do when, you, when you're checking it is you give it to somebody who's not part of your research team and say, do you agree with my analysis of the data? And better still, can you use your telescope and point it at my target and see if you can see it? Mm-hmm. So the minute that you, you, do, you start confirming whether this thing is real or not, the information is slowly dissipating out into the scientific community. And scientists love Twitter. 
Right. It's one of the things that they use to engage directly with the public. It's a great tool, but it's also a great way to say, I know something you don't know, and to start to hint about you know something really exciting. So all the press releases we've seen.